Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 107 of the American Muslim Experience, and a happy new year to our listeners. We are uh, we are joining here today on our first episode of 2021. Alhamdulillah, like it's uh, we we finally crossed that big uh, that threshold, man. Right, Omar of uh, of 2020. So uh, uh, we're welcoming in the new year, and we're doing it in in, in good stride. Yeah, assalamu alaikum, everyone. A happy new year to everybody listening. Uh, and yeah, it's a it's a new day. It's 2021. Can you believe it? Yeah, that's right, man. We're uh, finally the uh, what is it? Uh, but as they say, the past is prologue. So hopefully, you know, not in this instance, but uh, 2020 is finally behind us. Um, but uh, how, how have you been? How, how have you been enjoying some time off from work and whatnot? Yeah, I got some time off work, which is nice. Um, just really didn't even do much. Just kind of just got some R and R in, and uh, it was it was nice. It wasn't very memorable. I mean, there wasn't really any you know uh, picture worthy moments or anything like that. But uh, it, was, it was a nice nice down, some nice downtime and going back tomorrow. So uh, yeah, I work. mean, unfortunately, we didn't even get to spend the new year together. I mean, we we, we really uh, obviously California is in pure lockdown, but um, we we tend to kind of uh, opt on that. Uh, I guess uh, d- like sort of default with uh, being overly conservative, which I think Kamdala has. Uh, been a good thing but um yeah i i also wanted to uh call out to uh a few patrons who joined um you know we we we, uh as the year was closing out i guess people uh uh, alhamdulillah hit us up and we have had some uh, very very generous actually patrons join um and again as a plug if you are interested in becoming a patron of the show please do go to um patreon.com slash diffuse congruence and you can join with a small or generous. Uh, oh, they're all generous, but small or large uh, monthly uh, monthly uh, uh, patronage fee. So we would always we always appreciate that, and uh, it helps us to do the work that we do and bring you the kind of guests that we're going to bring you today. Which I am to- I am really psyched about this episode. And I, I know I say that about everything, but um, you know we have a guest on today uh, that is uh, Tariq Al Masidi. Uh, he was a Muslim American speaker, activist, social entrepreneur. Um, you probably know him best from uh, the Celebrate Mercy uh, project, which he uh, founded. Um, Tariq uh, is, and I say I'm just psyched and excited because it, it was really kind of like a Venn diagram. If we were to compose a Venn diagram of where I think I think a lot of the guests that we've had on the show and a lot of uh, people that we consider to be mentors and influencers on us are the same people who have been uh, not only featured in Celebrate Mercy's uh, programming, but also, um, you know, have been mentors and, uh, you know, thought leaders that I know Tharik has has, has, has also, um, has has been, has made an indelible impact on the work that Tharik does. And so um, without really further ado, Tharik, I I know we'll get into a lot of uh, not only your own background, uh, as well as, of course, Celebrate Mercy's while we have you on mic, so I'll 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 keep the introduction short because I want to do true justice to you and the work you do. So welcome to uh, to the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here, and uh, mashallah, you you've had such great uh, thought leaders, scholars, activists, you know, um, on the show. So it's definitely an honor. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, Tharik and I, uh, you know, we always get we always start with an origin story, Tharik, and 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 I know uh, I, I know eventually you'll get to this particular point in your own story, but uh, where I think our paths crossed uh, was years and years ago. I, I want to say, oh, I, I'm terrible with dates, but it had to have been in the late '90s. Uh, I mean, you could probably place it better better because you were, I believe, uh, MSA president at the time. But I visited the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, for uh, like a like a weekend with lectures, and, and I think I was just one of the speakers that was att- was in attendance. But I think that's probably the first time we met. I, I don't know if you remember that. I I, I remember that trip very very fondly. Um, so um, in fact, you know what? Now I remember it had to have been like two thousand two, two thousand three, two thousand three, because um, one of the parting presents that the MSA gave was uh, my wife and I were expecting our first our our, our, our eldest daughter. And so we were pregnant. And I think I, I, I mentioned that and it was like this beautiful little uh, the volunteers onesie uh, for a baby. I remember <laughs> that. that. Right orange, so, right? Yeah. And so it was a great little parting gift that the MSA gave me. And so it had to have been, yeah. 20, like yeah. 2000. I think that was like um, maybe the year after I 
um, I was president of the year after I graduated undergrad and I was still there in Knoxville, but I definitely remember when you visited, I definitely remember that. Yeah. And, and I, although our paths have, I think, uh, crossed over the years. Um, in fact, it was, uh, a mutual friend, an old friend of yours. Uh, but again, going back to the, uh, Knoxville MSA days, uh, Imran Qureshi, who I want to mention his name on, on, on air as, as putting us sort of in touch and together. And, uh, Imran is a listener of the show and we're honored to have Folks like Imran listening. So yeah, um, we went to high school together. Actually, and, and wow, uh, so, fair to get high school. So yeah, I guess uh, I guess start. You know, like I said, we we like to dive into it, like kind of an origin story. So uh, tell us about um, you know growing up in in Tennessee of all places. If that's <laughs> really where your origin story begins. Yeah, Bismillah. So um, my my parents are both immigrants from Egypt. Uh, that's I guess where the story begins. My dad coming over in the late seventies, uh, and my mom, sh- you know, not too too much later after that. And um, uh, he came for grad school and and just has been his state ever since from Egypt, uh, civil engineer, um, and. We moved around quite a bit. I was born in Houston, actually. And I think you're, really? yeah, you're from Houston, right? I am, and I was born in Texas. Uh, <laughs> although I spent most of my, yeah, young life in 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 in, in Houston. And uh, uh, Omar also overlapped in Houston for a little bit, um, and uh, was born in New Orleans. So oh, nice. another Southern boy. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually the only sibling not born in Texas. So. That's right. <laughs> I'm nice. the outlier. Yeah, and I still have relatives there, actually. And we we uh, moved around a bit, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, but eventually settled in Knoxville with my dad's uh, work, you know, move, moving around. Um, so since the second grade, I grew up in East Tennessee, um, near the Smoky Mountains in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's the third largest city. And um, it was really then that we became, you know, active with the local Muslim community. I, I remember, you know, I, I vaguely remember them like actually built building their first, you know, uh, mosque from scratch. You know, uh, first at first it was like a rented home, and then I remember like in the the early '80s or mid '80s when they were building that first mosque, you know, purpose built mosque. Um, and Sunday school was really like where I began to learn about my faith. Um, and yeah, that's where everything began. I think like where I, where I really became, you know, growing up in like a 90% white, you know, very evangelical kind of Bible belt, uh, city, uh, in Tennessee, although it was, you know, it's a, it's a university city. Um, but you know, where, where I grew up in West Knoxville, you know, there, there, very Baptist and, and people are, you know, often trying to like convert you, you know, sometimes, you know, even classmates, you know, um, Jesus loves you and whatnot. So I, I, you know, I, 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 yeah. People are very open about their faith and, uh, you know, for, for someone who hasn't, for, for listeners who haven't lived in the South, you know, um, you know, typically you could be at, literally you could be at a grocery store and the second or third question that you are asked, uh, you know, Oh, like that's you know that's an you know interesting name, sweetheart. And then they'll they'll ask you like what you know what church you go to. It's literally you know, and so oh, yeah. you know, the, and so for people I think who haven't lived in the South or are not from the South, that you know that would be kind of really uh, you know unsettling, I guess. But you know if you aren't used to that, but uh, yeah, certainly in in the South, I mean, I th- I don't think you're wrong in terms of uh yeah, I mean whether it's evangelical or not, people are just very uh, I guess open and public about talking about religion and church and so on. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, that, that almost kind of put me on the defensive a little bit because people were really into religion, really into church and, and, you know, uh, often bringing it up in conversation and like, so what, what do you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? You know, it, it's probably around the middle school years that I really got into, uh, Ahmad Didat, you know, like the VHS tapes and the, the debates and all of that. And, uh, I think that actually really, uh, for the first time, helped me like answer questions like, "Why do I believe what I believe? You know, why do I believe what I believe is is the truth with a capital T? Uh, and and how do I engage in these conversations with people who are trying to convert me to Christianity? You know, so um, those those VHS tapes that are like some of the classics now <laughs> were like really right. seminal for me in establishing my identity. You know, I had some also really great Sunday school teachers. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that it was 
a small community really helped because um, the fact that like we had one mosque, one mosque in the city of, of all the races, all ethnicities um, really was beautiful for me to grow up in, in, in that environment where, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't like an African American mosque and a Pakistani mosque and like an Arab mosque, but like my friends were, were very diverse. Um, so I think, you know, those, those VHS tapes, you know, eventually like the Imam Suraj, you know, cassettes, you know, the, and then, um, then later on, like maybe late high school, like the Sheikh Hamza Yusuf cassette tapes, you know, and then going to some conferences, like, you know, initially as an Arab kid going to the Maya conferences early in the day, you know, like, I remember um, Maya. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those were, I, I was like really in like, and especially my high school years, really in like Dawa mode, you know, like I just, I wanted people to, and, and I and also like at that time you had things like, um, you know, the first world trade center attack. Um, you had, uh, you know, initially when the Oklahoma city bombing happened, like they, people were initially, they jumped on, like, uh, I remember, you know, you know, being called, you know, that the sand N word, you know, like in, in school and, and things like that. Like, so, I knew growing up, middle and high school, that like most, you know, not not without my daughter and all that stuff. Like I knew that how Arabs and Muslims were portrayed, and I I was really at a young age um, determined to change the narrative on how we are perceived as as Muslims, what people think we believe, and you know misconceptions about our faith. Um, in high school, I started like a Muslim club, you know, call, it, it was eventually called Natural Inclination, which kind of like the translation for Fitra, you know, Beautiful. and Beautiful. We, would, we would bring speakers there and like, why do we, you know, the proof of the existence of God and this and that. And like, I was really in Dawa mode, big time. Quick um, question. Yeah. Um, so demographically, when you think of uh, Tennessee, you think of African-American. My brother used to live in Memphis. Um, so my question to you is, what was the demographic of your school your high school specifically and then how many muslims did you have that were your peers because what you described initially was very similar to how i grew up in spokane washington which is one mosque all different races mostly white but i actually didn't have a lot of muslim peers so i'm curious what that experience was for you yeah so memphis and knoxville are the complete opposite you know so like so knoxville is more like 90 percent white uh, and, uh, and even Nashville is very different, right? So Knoxville is, mm -hmm. you know, very white. Um, and my school, you know, is school about 4,000, uh, students, I believe. Um, it was a very big high school and we only had about 20 Muslims there, but not all even were that practicing. Um, you know, I, I established like this, uh, Zohar prayer and even like a five minute Joma there for the first time ever and got like, special permission for us to be late to class so we could pray, you know, through her prayer. And, uh, but we were, you know, we, we did what we could. Um, and late, you know, after graduating high school, I had the opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of as a graduation gift to go to Morocco for the Rehla program with uh, Sheikh Hamza Youssef and, and other teachers. I definitely want to talk about that, um, but I, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I still want to maybe stay with you a little bit in high school, um, you know, and we'll, we'll talk also about the natural inclination, because I think that really kind of begins, like you said, um, your your kind of activist mode, um, although still maybe, in, like you said, Dawa mode, uh, which let's translate that or let's maybe unpack Dawa mode, because that's such a, and again, because that, for me as a listener, um, and my own experiences in the 90s, I know exactly what you mean when you say Dawa mode. But I think, it, and, and we haven't, I mean, this is, I think, a great sort of um, anthropological or sociological kind of thing, which is to, to kind of really unpack that. Because, I mean, obviously, 90s Islam was very formative for people of our, I mean, a lot of us sort of came to came came of age in 90s Islam, as I say, in America. And, and, and I say that, and at the same time, that itself is sort of a loaded kind of packed term. And, you know, you always have to kind of pause and allow for at least those who perhaps didn't grow up in the 90s or, you know, were not as connected to a large Muslim community, kind of even like Omar's background, who don't share that kind of shared experience. So um, I'd love to kind of unpack Dawa mode because I think you already touched on some key uh, salient features, if you will, <laughs> right. mode, which is Ahmadidat. So that kind of 
combative but defensive um uh what's the word a polemical kind mm-hmm. of approach to interfaith dialogue um and and really but at the same time and i don't I, I don't want to paint it as a negative because at the same time this really this impassioned sense of muslim identity that 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 that, that you fill up with by consuming content like the late you know, Ahmad Didat, you know, may Allah have mercy on him. Amen. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, so I'd love for you to kind of, t- maybe if you've thought about it consciously or lo- if you haven't, we'd you know, love to do it on the show. Let's yeah. kind of back that, yeah. I-, I think that's really what I needed at the time, but obviously in retrospect, you know, I, I uh, you know, nobody really like became Muslim through debates, you know, like, you know, like, you know, but but I needed it for my own, you know, identity, you know, just like, why do we believe? Why don't? Why don't we believe in the Trinity? Why don't we believe? You know that Jesus is God. You know, peace be upon him. And um, and you know, I, I think um, you know having those debates kind of in kind of like I guess strongly rooted my own faith. You know, made me on a you know maybe on a, a mentally, um, intellectually. You know, had to explore like why I believe what I believe. What do I believe? Um, you know, but in retrospect. Um, you know, so my, my, my religion was very combative, I would say, like, you know, just in terms of debate, um, you know, kind of trying to poke holes and, in, 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 you know, mostly because my peers were Christian, like poke holes in their own theology. Um, and, polemical. You know, yeah. yeah, very polemical. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that's, that's, I think that really defined like my Dawa mode, you know, I guess you sure, could say. Sure. Very, and like, another, uh, yeah. And I'm curious if, if, because for me, again, this is just from my own experiences. So by no means are they perhaps universal, but also for me, Dawa mode, another, again, if you will, salient feature is coming from a home that is somewhat religious. I would say, you know, religious for the most part, but not, um, not ideologically framed. So our, you know, the religion I was born in sort of brought in, brought, you know, brought up in, in the household was, you know, the importance of the Quran, love of the prophet, respect for elders, you know, those type of sort of values um, and, and, and very important, even theological things, uh, underpinnings. But at the same time, it wasn't, you know, ideologically framed to the point where when I got to college, for example, and I, my, the MSA was predominantly uh, Salafi or Wahhabi or whatever you want to call it, or let's just say you 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 got into a a, a, a a situation or a space that was very ideological. You didn't, you weren't inoculated with the ability to, you know, how do you suddenly navigate that? Because you were kind of brought up with this, you know, kumbaya kind of, you know, everybody, it, it's all the same. We're a big tent religion, right? Big tent community. And then you get into the real world and you realize, wait a minute, you know, I wasn't inoculated for this. Like, I don't have the sort of built in, you know, mechanism to be able to understand and navigate all of that. And, you know, you go through periods of uh, perhaps some confusion then. Um, Would you say that that was, was that similar to your background coming, you know, being the child of immigrant, uh, Egyptian immigrants in particular? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I think um, my faith growing up, middle, high school, elementary school, was focused on these are the articles of belief. These are the five pillars. Um, You know, I didn't know anything about like schools of thought, ideology. I didn't really get into politics much. You know, um, it was mainly centered around, I would say, theology and, and also just like this is haram, this is haram, this is haram, you know, like, like Sunday school, Sunday school consisted of mainly like, this is why that we don't, we don't do this. We don't do this. We don't do this. <laughs> you know, I was going to say like, I, I, I think our, our curriculum was like the standardized, although they probably wasn't standardized, but it just by way of osmosis, it became this sort of standardized Sunday school curriculum mm-hmm. coupled with whenever you had the, when you, whenever you weren't in school or something, the community Juma Khutbah. So it was your sort of standard Khutbah version of Islam and your standardized uh, Sunday school curriculum version, which I'm not, again, I don't say that as, as, as being, um, you know, to problematize it, but I'm just saying that it's just a fact. And, uh, but like, yeah, like you said, not getting in too much into the details, into the sort of, certainly not into the sort of intellectual tradition of Islam, much more so focused on identity. So I, you know, clearly demarking lines of haram and halal and so on, uh, you know, Halloween, Christmas, et cetera, right, right. right. You're getting that reinforced. And then on top of it, so it's, it is very doctrinal. 
Yes. Yes. That's a good way to define it. Yep. That's how I and, grew and up. So when you went off to college, was it very similar or were you all of a sudden exposed to a lot more and how did you handle that? And, 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 um, in terms of the diversity of what you were seeing? Well, so what, what I was really fortunate to, to experience was that between, you know, in that summer before, before starting undergrad, before going to, to college, um, I, at the age of 17, I went to a one month program in Morocco, uh, the Rehla program, um, with, you know, teachers like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and others. Um, and that was like a whole different world, you know, like, I mean, there, you know, there are, uh, people that went on that program that have, you know, have gone on to do amazing things. It was a seminal moment, I think, for every, most people who were there. Right. Like, 90s? Um, late late, 90s? Yeah, was 98, 98. Yeah. 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 I thought so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, you, I think the Rehla, the predecessor of the Rehla program, and we've talked about this on the show with other guests, was I think the uh, the the powwows they used to have. I think they used to literally call them powwows, um, and then um, which were often in England, but I think maybe even in the Bay Area or, or maybe late or mid nineties. Uh, and then yeah, late nineties was the uh, was the yeah, but by then Rehla had become yeah. a thing. And I think that's where the the faith you know with the tradition for me which i didn't ever refer to it as, as a tradition back then but like that's when i you know had to take a step back and and and, and witnessed that this was a very devotional you know a religion that you actually taste you know it wasn't it wasn't just like oh the five pillars and you know the articles of faith and you know we don't believe in a trinity and haram 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 it was like wow this is a this is a this is a tradition that that is a beautiful intellectual tradition, spiritual tradition, um, and even the rituals are beautiful. And there, there's a, there's like spiritual meaning behind what we do, you know. So I I, I went in like you know kind of like with this uh, you know Sunday school the Sunday school kid just got exposed to like people who were like making dhikr uh, after each prayer in the mosque and like. You know, I'll tell you one thing that happened that that, re- that that was really beautiful is that as I was on the train from Casablanca to Fez, I was sitting with some Moroccans, you know, going to Fez. And one there was one man sitting near me who lived in Florida, but was coming back to visit family. He worked at like Subway Sandwiches. And when I told him I was going to this religious program in, at the Karawiyin, you know, mosque in Fez, he just was so jealous you know and he told me you know i i I wish i could do that and just spend so much time in the mosque uh because when i go to the mosque i feel like i'm partying with god and i was like i was like whoa whoa, whoa, like that's haram my initial gut reaction was like you can't can't say the word party and god in the same sentence like what do you mean partying with god you know but like like blasphemous yeah yeah, but what I saw from you know most of the Moroccans I interacted with is they had this view of religion as like that something they loved, that they tasted, that they that they like sometimes even like you know uh, brought them ecstasy and joy, you know. And and I and I hadn't experienced that growing up much. I had not experienced people who really like tasted their faith, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so Morocco was a very transformational uh, program for me, and it, it really colored my entire experience in college after that. And I, I tried to bring more of my peers, you know, people that people like Imran and others that I went to high school with, like to, to all these programs, I took them to Dean intensives. And I was like, you have to see that we are like a, a faith of Iman and Islam and Ihsan, like, you know, mind, body, soul, like we are more than just the five pillars and a list of, you know, what you don't do, you know? Right. Yeah, you know, it, 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 I think it, that's a great framing of it, right? This kind of evolution from from devotional to, or excuse me, from doctrinal to devotional, you know, because again, the way I was, uh, I later discovered um, as I was kind of going back and, you know, just more conversations with your parents about, you know, well, how what was your religious life back in India or back in your home country? And you come to learn that, you know, it was very devotional, uh, or in, at least in my case, again, I'm not trying to universalize my experiences. But it was very devotional, uh, a household where the Borda was recited every Thursday evening, where, you know, there were various, uh, uh, you know, majalis that, 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 that people of the household attended. 
of females, males, etc. And yet, and what happens is, you know, that you come to, you know, they, they immigrated to America. It's they're part of this growing, burgeoning Muslim community. And then it becomes almost like sort of survival mode. Um, right. Because you're, you're, you're starting a family, you're, you're, you're in a foreign and strange land. Um, it, obviously overwhelmingly vast, you know, vastly non-Muslim. And so you automatically kind of adopt this very, uh, I don't want to say siege mentality, but a very defensive posture. Mm-hmm. And, and by, by way of that, you sort of trim the fat as it were. So it's like, let's just focus on the basics and let's just get them, you know, tr- you know, get them instilled in them some sense of Muslim identity. And by them, I mean our children. And then, you know, we'll just set them out. And, and so that was really the approach that I think a lot of immigrants took. Uh, Trip, trimming then, the fat, not, I think, is one way to look at it. And I think it was I didn't mean that's, again, kind of sound no, no, very. I, no, no, I know what you mean, exactly what you mean. But, and, but I, I also think it was even for those people who didn't fully embrace the, the Salafism or Harbism, I think there was a bit of, yeah, we did that, but uh, not really 100% that was the right thing to do. And we're not really going all the way into Salafism, but we're not really sure. So we're going to kind of avoid that and just focus on what we know to be 100% um, good, right? So it was, it, was, it was a bit of focus on what we can focus on given time and priority, but a bit of also un, um, yeah. unclarity or not having full confidence in what they knew. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Omar. And I, and I don't want to get too much into politics, but I mean, I think, yeah, it would be naive for me not to, or for us to not, you know, consider the fact that there was at that same time in the late 80s, in the 80s and 90s, certainly, there was a, a, an, an influx of a particular ideologies that were coming in to the American Muslim community. So it was this, you know, so the community itself was shifting from this very kind of bare bone, let's say, if we want to avoid the kind of from the fat kind of narrative or approach, but kind of a bare bone approach to now being kind of witnessing this influx of various ideologies, one of which being Wahhabi Salafi, but also, I would argue, Ikhwani, I mean, coming from Egypt, right? I mean, or yeah, that part of the Middle East, all right? Um, Ikhwani, Jamaati, Islami, etc. And so, you know, so you you had that influx of these various political ideologies that became kind of the, yeah, like you said, Omar, it was the approach that was infused within most Muslim communities in America. And I think, uh, Tharik, to your point, I think we can all appreciate the sea change that individuals like Sheikh Hamza, how they alternated and shifted the the, uh, discourse, let's say, the Muslim discourse on a communal level, and and even if we just take ISNA as an example, like let's th- you know this large annual event where the Muslim community by and large gathers in North America. I always used ISNA as kind of a lamppost of where things were. You you see that with the very kind of um, you know who occupied ISNA prime time, right? The list <laughs> right, of speakers. Right. right. Suddenly, Sheikh Hamza and Imam Zaid were the most sought after uh, and attended lectures. Um, and again, that's not to say that those that preceded them uh, were, you know, ideological. Or anything I, I like remember, that. yeah, I remember. Yeah. I remember late in high school where you know it was kind of like there, you know, it's like you know people used to like circulate these mixtapes, you know, like of, of music. But back then, it was like you know your currency as an active Muslim was like you know it was a Imam Siraj cassette tape. Or, I love that, and I and I, and I and I distinctly remember when someone said, "Wait, there's this new guy. Mm-hmm. Like he he's the thing now. Like and it, it, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Like listen to this, you know. Like and, and <laughs> that was like. And, I, and when I played it, I was like, "Whoa, who is yeah. this guy? You know, That's, like, right. That's right. And, no, and, no, and no, but, but but like you said, like yeah, th- th- these th- this the beauty of the tradition and the spiritual tradition, you know, um, is part of our heritage, you know. And and I find myself now in the last decade or two trying to re-explore that you know I, I've, I've been recording for example my grandmother you know the the stories of the past and trying to go back make a family tree and I I've learned some amazing things about like you know about Egypt but also just my own family background and and uh you know it's 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 um uh, it's something that I wish I knew growing up more about you know yeah exactly wow, and- wow. that that's actually just to just a side note uh, we actually are starting and, and did start a kind of a series on the show here called Immigrant Stories. We've we've done a one 
one episode I've prepared so far, and we have ideas for more of those where we um, interview and hear the stories of our elders uh, about w- what life was like just before they came to the U.S. and, and really after what their experience was like yeah. in the 70s and 70s and so on. Yeah, like my, I'll just give like two examples. My grandmother like rem- was actually raised by her own grandmother and she remembers, like she could tell me like when her grandparents went to Hajj, basically riding camels, you know, from Egypt to, to Mecca, you know, she remembers that and she tells that story. And, and she even like, I, I later discovered that there's a maternal ancestor of mine who was a, a big like spiritual sage and scholar from centuries ago who established an endowment in his village in Egypt, you know, inspired by the, the, the prophetic tradition, the hadith of a prostitute who gave water to a dog, right? And she was, she attained salvation because she fed, you know, she gave a dog, like a a thirsty dog water. This scholar was inspired by that to start an endowment that ensured that every dog in his village had water always, you know, basically until the, until the end of time, no dog, no dog in that village would go thirsty, you know, inspired. inspired, And I was like, this is amazing stuff. I I want to know this, you know? (laughs) Right. Subhanallah. And and yeah, there, there you go. Like, again, it was like, Islam was this lived experience. It was, you know, uh, and it was informed by your devotion and your connection to God, certainly, but it was this lived experience. And I think what you were also sharing on that train ride um, in Morocco, where, you know, the Moroccan, you know, at least the Moroccan people that you encountered where, you know, Islam was this lived experience. And, you know, I, I think it was very telling the way you described, like, you know, when he said party with, it's like, it's like, you know, partying with Allah like your initial reaction is to judge it from that doctrinal perspective. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, this is a blasphemous statement. <laughs> but then when you think of it from a devotional perspective, you just realize this is a person experiencing ecstasy, right? The ecstatic experiences that, that, that again, we talk about in the, the in the tradition of the soul wolf. And that's what those people are, you know, that's what he's sharing. And, and, and he's sharing that joy and that, like you said, the though, right. The tasting of, of one's faith and religious connection. Yeah, um, I've, I've actually never story. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I've actually never heard, uh, or maybe I just never really um, internalized the term taste, and it, it actually makes total sense. And now it's coming together why you chose, and we're maybe we're getting a little ahead, but it's coming together why you chose the name "celebrate mercy." Right? It's a celebration. Uh, it's not. It's not just learning about mercy or yeah. or uh, documenting mercy. Right? It's celebrating it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no. And and thank you, Omar, for that. I, I think yeah, we do we do want to move the conversation along. So I yeah. So so when you come back, like so you, you know this Rehla was this transformative experience, Tharik. Mm-hmm. You come back. Um, a lot of your peers back in the MSA or the people that you encounter at the university, going again, even kind of going back to Omar's question. Um, what was that like? Like, I think that's what you were answering. And then we went into yeah. all these tangents. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, the MSA before I, I came to college was very, I would say like ideologically driven. It focused a lot on like, you know, uh, you know, political lectures, like, you know, uh, I think like it, it emphasized politics a lot, you know, programs on palace, the Palestine issue and this and that. And like, when I, when I came in as a freshman, I was like, Hey guys, there's this whole other world to explore about our, our spiritual tradition and, and, you know, um, the beauty of Islam. And so I, I, I immediately start to started to bring friends to these Dean intensive programs, um, expose them to what I was exposed to in Morocco. And eventually we became, um, you know, uh, elected as the leaders of the MSA. And we completely changed the, the Muslim student association at the university, uh, bringing in, a lot of the teachers that we had learned from at these Dean intensives. And, uh, you know, uh, we started like, you know, doing like vicar at the mosque, you know, like we, 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 we had to, we, but we butted heads a lot. We butt heads a lot with some of the uncles who were like, not really into that stuff, you know? Um, but we, we were people that had gone to the Dean intensives. We wanted to, you know, we wanted to introduce even non-Muslims, like people of other faiths to, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the Sufi tradition and, and this and that. And like, um, what we had been exposed to at these programs. So our, our MSA became kind of a devotional MSA. Uh, I was still in, in Dawa mode. I wanted to share Islam with others. I wanted to break down misconceptions, but instead of uh, doing it through debate, 
I want it to just expose people to the beauty of our faith. I want it, you know, instead of like, instead of saying like, you know, well, here are some contradictions in the Bible. Like, you know, like I was saying, no, I mean, if you're a Christian, that means you're denying uh, that the prophet Muhammad was a prophet. You know, why don't you just give him a chance? Like just read about his life and then, and then come back to me and say like that he, you know, that he made this up or that he was uh, false, you know? And so I would, I really wanted, I went into like this mode of like sharing the beauty of Islam uh, as opposed to defending Islam. And and it looks like you got some traction within the Muslim community. I specifically remember, I could be wrong, but around 03 ish, I remember a Dean intensive in Knoxville. I could be wrong about that, but my memory, if my memory serves me correct, uh, like a shorter one, but my curious, my, I'm curious, um, you got some traction within the community, within the MSA. What about with the, the non-Muslim community, um, did you get any traction with those who were initially calling you to go to church and whatnot? And specifically, I'm guessing after 9-11, there was probably interest out uh, in, that, in that community as well. Yeah. To actually uh, learn, right? 9-11 was a very, another seminal moment in my life because I was president of the Muslim Student Association when that happened. And um, honestly, like I knew that a window had been opened where people were wanted to know about Islam, you know, all the media was focused on Muslims. Um, and, and, uh, actually even in the, at the mosque and the, you know, kind of the adults in the community, none of them would want to appear in the media. So I almost kind of became a spokesperson for the entire Muslim community of Knoxville as an undergraduate student right after nine 11. And that is actually in that semester, uh, two months after nine uh, 11, we started the first ever, Ramadan fastathon in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, where we basically said, um, you know, uh, for the non-Muslims on campus, try fasting in Ramadan for a day, and uh, for every person that pledges to fast, a local uh, business will give money to feed the hungry. So the slogan was "Go hungry for a day, so someone else won't have to." And everyone who pledges to fast will break fast, will break bread together. Um, at Maghrib time, at sunset time. Um, and so we tried it in 2001, the very first fastathon. And, you know, we had 100 people who pledged. And, uh, and then the next year, um, we put together this like 30 page manual, like how to hold a fastathon on campus. And uh, I, I gave a call to like, uh, made a call to Altaf Hussein, the MSA National, the president of MSA National. And I was like, listen, you got to scale this. It, it worked in Knoxville. It can work everywhere. And literally within a few years, the fastathon had spread to 300 uh, campuses worldwide, you know, even in Europe. And it, it all came full circle for me years later. Because I was working after graduate school, I got an MBA. I was working at Procter and Gamble, and I and I and I and I sent an email to all my coworkers saying, "Hey, I'm about to start this this month called Ramadan, and I'm going to be fasting. And if I'm a little, you know, like you know, a little irritable, like you know why, you know, if I'm not going to eat lunch with you, you know why also." And then this one guy came up to me. He was like, "I from Nebraska. My co my, he was a, he also like a a new a new hire." He came to me and he said, I know what Ramadan is because at the University of Nebraska, I did this thing called Fastathon. Have you heard That's of it? Amazing. Have you heard of it before? You know? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you know? So it really yeah. is. I, here I thought we just had the founder of Celebrate Mercy on. I, I had no idea you were, I mean, you know, I, you, you, you may not call attention to it or frame it this way, but, you know, the founder of Fastathons, man. That's yeah, amazing. Allah. That's, Allah, amazing. Allah, that's beautiful. Because, yeah. um, and when you say campuses, because what came to mind for me, you know, Omar, and, and maybe you can share experiences, but like from a Silicon Valley perspective, I mean, you have corporations do fastathons. I know, I know, I think yes. Google does it. Yes. Facebook, yeah. So uh, there's, there's a, almost, almost 20 Google headquarters worldwide that have done fastathons. And they, they actually send me like a t shirt every year, you know, like of their, of the Google uh, fastathons. And now I, I know at Facebook, wow. Facebook, they do it. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, it's, it's been like what, 20 years now, almost since it started. I, I do hope that it can move more to the mosque level and, and the corporate level uh, in the future. 
Yeah. Are, are colleges still, do you know if yeah. you've been tracking if colleges are still doing oh, they're, they're every Yeah, I, I still speak at some fast-a-thons actually. And they, they still, you know, I mean, Ramadan obviously moved into the summer. So it kind of went down a little bit, but now it's coming back into like April mm-hmm. and stuff. So like, I think there's going to be a resurgence of fast-a-thons. And there are some universities in, in like the, you know, around the, the 2006, 2007 that got up to 3,000 people to fast uh wow. at their like ut austin was one of them and university of maryland um they got like three thousand people to fast on the same day and uh you know I, i've even heard of like you know you know we're talking about taste like that immediately takes people who are not muslim and and they step into the shoes of a muslim for one day and they eat like you know they eat a lot of our ethnic foods in the evening and they see muslims make the adhan and they pray and we encourage them to like ask them to pray with you, like let them stand in the prayer line while you're praying Maghrib and pray with you. I, I know of people who've actually become Muslim through fastathons at the, at the university of Maryland, that the head of the atheist club participated in a fastathon and became Muslim. I mean, wow. like, and I, and I know that's a true story, you know? So yeah. like uh, when we're talking about, like I went from this, this, you know, P- a polemic, you know, debate, like be that yeah. mode to like, you know, just share what, who we are with them, share the beauty of your faith. And Alhamdulillah, like even in those undergrad years, like it, uh, I feel like it, it really changed a lot of hearts and minds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it reminds me of what you shared about your uh, kind of um, someone in your a- ancestry about, you know, starting an endowment just so that dogs in the locality would have water to drink because, and that's so beautiful because, you know, again, just drawing on experiences from my own teachers who just, you know, like their approach to dawah, as it were, their dawah mode is feed people, mm-hmm. you know, is, is, is feed people is, is be hospitable to people. And that's it. That's all they talk yeah, about. Yeah. It's not, they don't, they're not getting into doctrine. And like you said, you know, it, and, it, and it's funny because, you know, I still have like, there's parts of me that will initially have this sort of knee jerk reaction to certain things. So, for example, like when you mentioned about, you know, welcoming non-Muslims to join the prayer ranks, you can probably cite a doctrinal position that says that, 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 you know, that, that disqualifies the prayer or, it, or, it, or it's makru or whatever, right? But it's like, look at the beauty of what you're doing. And, and again, the fruit lies or the proof lies in the fruit, right? And, and people are embracing Islam. People are tasting Islam for the first time just because you're allowing them even if it were to, like I said, not necessarily compromise, but if you were to take a position that is an outlier, for example, that it doesn't disqualify or, and again, I'm not versed in this, but I'm just throwing, you know, this idea out where, you know, again, if we just stick to doctrine alone, um, it only gets us so far. Yeah. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love how this conversation has gone from what I expected was just to hear about kind of the origins of an organization, a nonprofit and kind of the, where that's gone. And we've really talked about something I didn't expect to, which I'm really enjoying, which is taking an experience that you had personally and just sharing it, not in the proselytizing or pushy uh, way and not to get, not to get anything, but just sharing that experience. So other people can, taste like a taste yeah and, 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 and i and i believe that anyone who has like uh, you know from the tens of thousands maybe even hundreds of thousands of people who have participated in a fastathon i assure you that they have they probably think very differently of muslims and islam after that experience you know and um they they've come away they come away i mean the testimonials we we got from so many people was was amazing you know it was amazing and uh, it takes it takes it takes you know, Muslims getting out of their comfort zone a little bit. Like, you know, initially when we, the Fastathon first began, and, and Al Taf will tell you the same thing, like they got a lot of criticism. Like some MSAs were like, this is an innovation. This is bid'ah. This is, yeah, how, right. why, how can you, how can you invite them to fast? They're not getting rewarded for their fasting, like all these things. But, you know, years, years later, it's, it's, uh, now it is, it's actually like, kind of like, Islam, you know, in the 90s when Islam Awareness Week was the thing, Right, like fastathon became kind of a household world, a uh, household word after like the two thousands, you know. And uh, alhamdulillah, like I mean, I'm actually, I, I actually call myself the co-founder because it was my uh, roommate um, at the time named Sean Blevins, who was a convert. He was actually a co-founder with me, so it's like, uh, so I always have to give him credit as well. Like my idea was. 
let's ask them to fast. His idea was let's tie it to charity as well. Yeah. That's oh, amazing. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I want to just sort of leave anything lingering. Uh, Tharik, uh, just again, if, if people who do listen, um, when I was talking about sort of like doctrinally and, and positions juristically and so on, I mean, do you know, like, what did you consult with anyone? Like, was there, what was the general kind of like, even religious, if you will, or doctrinal position about things like that? Uh, you know, do you, I mean, if you want to comment on that or if you're comfortable, I, I don't know. You like, know, I just didn't want to leave we, something like an open yeah. question. Um, you know, we we had we consulted many scholars on it, and we we really the, the scholars that I learned from said this is a beautiful thing. I mean, we've had people like Imam Zaid Shekhar and others who have you know keynoted fastathons. You know, so uh, all of my teachers said this is an amazing initiative. This is beautiful. Like. You know, you know, yes, they're not Muslim, but like, well, you know, they're they're raising money to feed the hungry. Um, this is this is a good thing, and like in, in many fastathons, they it's actually co-sponsored with a, multiple faith groups. You know, like in, in Tennessee, for example, like the Jewish student group and other groups like became co-sponsors sometimes of fastathons. Yeah. No, thank you for that, and 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 I just didn't want to leave, like I said, a, like any kind of lingering thought or question in <laughs> yeah. people's minds. But, but but I appreciate that. And honestly, um, like you know what 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 ended up happening is like you know we we break fast together. But in Tennessee and in Knoxville, we all some of the fasters used to just show up at IHOP, you know, to to have like you know sehri or sahur together, you know, the pre pre dawn meal. So like they they kind of start their day together and they end their day. It's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. So I got I got to just side note here. I've no I've noticed a few references to to the Urdu terminologies here, <laughs> yeah. uh, ranging from sehri to bhai. <laughs> so uh, you must have some. You must have some Again, uh, like I said, it was one mosque. We were all under the same. Yeah, group, there you go. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So okay, well, great. This has been. Let's let's talk. Let's let's move forward in time a bit. You graduate. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, like right out of school, do you, um, I mean, I, you, you, you went corporate for a while. Like, I mean, tell us a little bit about kind of your educational background, your early maybe corporate stuff. And then we can, yeah, I'd love to transition yeah. directly into, uh, uh, into celebrate mercy. So I, I, I ended up spending like five years in undergrad, despite the fact that I went in like with one year of credit, <laughs> you know, like, cause I kept, uh, the, you know, the, the MS, I mean, I would, I would say that I was a really good school student in high school got all these AP courses and 33 credit hours, you know, like, uh, like, all, yeah, like 3.97 GPA. But in college, I was so into the MSA that like my studies really suffered, you know, I was on the brink of losing my scholarship a few times. And I, I, I changed my majors a lot. Um, but I eventually settled on um, business and, you know, specifically like supply chain management back then was kind of called logistics. And, um, so because because UT has a really good you know supply chain program. So I ended up doing that for my undergrad. Um, I, I was kind of entrepreneurial for a year, kind of doing Islamic book distribution um, for a year while uh, becoming very active in my local mosque um, in Knoxville. Um, and um, I, I, I ended up going to Chicago for a year, uh, working at Astrolabe, if you remember, like the, uh, yeah, yeah. I had I, no idea. Yeah, wow. yeah. So I worked under the new owners of Astrolabe who had like purchased it from, you know, Mahmoud Cosme and those guys. Uh, and so I worked under yeah, them. Within Jawad, right? Jawad, Jawad yeah. Who's now with UPF. Yep. Yeah, all, there's right. so many, you know, the Venn diagram, you know, right it's, all, totally. it's all happening, totally. right? So like right. I worked in Chicago for a year and then went, uh, I went to Jordan for a year to study Arabic. Um, I, I worked as a school teacher there as a, at a private school teaching English and math to, you know, kind of like some upper class Jordanian children. Um, and, you know, I, I focused on, on Jordan on Tejweed, Arabic, um, but also was working there as well. I, I worked. Was that at the uh, Qasid? At Qasid, yeah. Qasid, yeah. In the yeah. early days of Qasid, yeah. And, um, with Sheikh Nuh Hamim Keller. Yeah, I was in that. For those, yeah, for those who yeah, I was, yeah, in, yeah, I was in that neighborhood, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and uh, I, and I worked a little bit for like Andalusian Arts, who did this Islamic calendar, longing for the divine. You know, I, I had so I had my I had my Chicago face for a year. I had a Jordan face for a year. I came back. Then I came back to Knoxville. I did graduate school. I did uh, a master's in business. And it's while I was in grad school that I, again, like got really deep into activism. And me and my local 
you know, the, all all the MSA like board members of the of the old days uh, or of the recent few you know few years ago, we ended up basically like taking over the mosque. We took over the local mosque in Knoxville. Um, we ran for the elections. We we mobilized, and all of those like all of those people who had started the fastathon ended up taking over the mosque um, and becoming the leaders of our local mosque, the mosque where we grew up in, the mosque where we remember them like setting the the cement foundation for. We ended up becoming the leaders of that mosque and um, and trying to you know affect change there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So tell us now, celebrate, where does celebrate mercy come in? Yeah. Obviously so, it had to be post post video on the web, right? So <laughs> right. Like, right. <laughs> exactly. So like uh, while I was, you know, while I was, you know, the, the, I, I was actually the president of the local mosque in Knoxville. Um, I ended up doing an internship in Cincinnati, Ohio for Procter and Gamble, like in corporate America. Um, and eventually moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. And while I was at Procter and Gamble, you know, working as a supply chain manager, um, I just remember, you know, being asked by, you know, Seekers Guidance at the time, can you moderate? Can you be like the MC of this webinar where we're raising money for the Haiti earthquake victims, and we're going to have people like Dr. Sherman Jackson and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, like join on webcam into this webinar. And I, so I was the MC on this webinar, which I've 2010. never, 2010, I had never experienced the webinar before. Um, and uh, this was like, yeah, January, 2010. And I, and I was like, this is amazing technology. This is amazing technology. It's like, it's almost like a Dean intensive, you know, maybe being brought to your living room. Right. Um, and then the month of Rabi al-Awwal was coming up you know, when Muslims like celebrate and they learn about the Prophet Sallallahu and, you know, peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad's birth month, right? And I was just on a plane and I thought, you know what? Muslims celebrate the Prophet Muhammad in this month that's coming up like all around the world. What if that could be brought to like a webinar setting? You know, what if we could have a webinar that celebrated the Prophet Muhammad, you know, and brought all these scholars from around the world into uh, an an event, a virtual event. And, you know, I thought about this and subhanAllah, like two or three days later, uh, you know, my mother calls me from Knoxville. I'm in Cincinnati, remember, still working at Procter & Gamble. She calls me right after the Friday prayer and she says, I, I wanted to tell you that, you know, one of my, w- one of my friends, like the local auntie told me she just had a dream that you were sitting in front of a large group of people telling Sira stories and singing songs about the prophet Muhammad. Like you were, you were in front of this huge group of people telling stories about the prophet Muhammad and, and singing songs about him in front of a large group of people. And I was like, and I'd never told my mom about this idea. Right. And I was like, that's a good sign. You know, that, 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 that that's right. a good sign. That's beautiful. And so many things started to happen. Like um, I started sending out these emails to big people like Yusuf Islam, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, others like, can you submit a five minute video? Can you, Sammy Yusuf, can you give us a five minute video? Uh, the first speaker that agreed to participate was Yusuf Islam. Mm. Wow. <laughs> you know, it was like, I thought would be the most difficult person and and, and yeah. omar and i will admit we are huge <laughs> cat stevens yeah, cat yusuf stevens. fans yeah. so uh, i mean from a musical yeah and then you know and then subhanallah like things just started to happen that you felt like there was a wind behind the sails like that mm-hmm. that there was some divine wind that was pushing this idea forward and like people that we never thought would submit videos submitted videos people that just came and like crashed on my couch to help us get us off the ground then you know the name came up like just celebrate mercy we eventually at, at first it was going to be called like you know uh you know all, all sorts of names that might have alienated people yeah. you know but like eventually we 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 came upon celebrate mercy we thought it was it was broad it was it was it had this imperative verb it sounds bold you know and yeah. uh yeah, and I do remember it being all over social media yeah. in 2010. Yeah, I think I, I'm pretty sure I did log on to the first yeah. one. That first uh, one had I, a lot of technical difficulties. Yeah, I, 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 I do remember that. You work out the kinks. You yeah. work out the kinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, but, um, that, no, but great. you know, and I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point this out, Tharik, because just you sharing your experiences about the early days of how the genesis of Celebrate Mercy came about and how you 
um, uh, essentially acquired or accrued content, sorry, not acquired, acc accrued content. It reminds me of my own sort of like, again, the, the kind of like e evolution as an activist and so on. And I think another salient feature of 90s Dawa mode is by the blessing of, of, of Allah, we were able to make and forge connections. Yes. So like I can, and you know, people ask like, and, and not to toot the show's horn, but you know, we've had some remarkable people on the show. Absolutely. And um, that's only by virtue of the fact that I can, you know, I, you know, Alhamdulillah, like Omar and I can pick up the phone, um, you know, and, and we can call a friend of a friend or even a friend directly who has an in, or I can, you know, again, Alhamdulillah, like I can pick up the phone and call like an Imam Siraj or a Professor Jackson and say, hey, would you, you know, can you be a guest on the show? Yeah. Right. I mean, but it's, that all all rooted in about, the, it's all rooted in the 90s, right? That's what I mean. All those connections. Like the minute you, you, you said Astrolabe, my ears perked up and you and I were talking about the Cosmies and Jawad Abdul Rahman. Like these are just the people's, you know, these are just characters and people who uh, were part of that 90s Islam that have now gone on to do beautiful things. I mean, you've mentioned Altaf Hussein more than once. Again, right? I mean, I can pick up the phone, call Altaf, and through Altaf, I'm, I, I now have access to his Rolodex uh, of people, let alone, you know, whatever limited people that I have contact with. So I think that's a, you know, we'd be remiss, right? If we didn't oh, yeah. point that and out. People ask all the time, like, how do you get these speakers on your right. webinars? And I'm like, well, it all was, I was in the bazaar at Isna and then, you know, as a teenager, like, or, or at that, you know, they started oh. in at Maya conferences, you know? Okay. Like, then in that case, since we're, we're talking about, it, I'm going to geek out a bit. How did you get in touch with uh, Yusuf Islam? Because like Pervez said, oh, yeah. Thank you. I'm a huge, huge fan of the person, but also the music. Uh, and, and, and now I know who to call when I want to try to <laughs> yeah. leverage a, a, a contact to get someone like That's that. That's bucket list uh, level. I'm, I'm just thinking you. Yeah. 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 How did, how did you just, uh, what was the connection there? Honestly, um, it was, I have never actually been in direct contact with him. It was through his son-in-law. And, uh, and, and it may have been that Astrolabe connection because Astrolabe distributed a lot of his cassette tapes back in the day and CD, eventually CDs, right? So um, I, his son-in-law made that happen multiple times for him to uh, record him for our webinars. And, um, you know, and honestly, like, again, it, it's, it's divine, you know, providence that uh, when Yusuf Islam said yes, everyone said yes. You know, all I had to say was, all I had to do was name drop and say, you know, do you want to be on this like first, first of its kind, you know, celebration webinar? And by the way, Yusuf Islam is part of it too. You know, right, like right. There you go. A no brainer. So like this domino effect happened. And, you know, one of the amazing things that happened in those first few weeks was we started our Twitter account um, at Celebrate Mercy. And oh, as soon as we established our Twitter account, you know, when you sign up for like a new uh, account on Twitter or an email address, a CAPTCHA appears where like the words appear like kind of funky and like mm -hmm. the number and you have to type in what you see on the screen. Yeah. So the captcha that appeared on Twitter when we signed up, all, all we said is the name is Celebrate Mercy. And uh and the captcha that appeared randomly generated, it said pluralistic Muhammad. Like it said like the words that came up by Twitter said pluralistic Muhammad. That's and fine. and and then and then, <laughs> you know, and then we, we were so we like fell off our chairs. We we're like this is a sign. This is a sign. And then when we started the Facebook account, a, a message, a captcha appeared that said, policeman Gabriel. Like, it literally said policeman. And then the third time when we posted a picture, a captcha appeared on Facebook. That's, and we have screenshots of this. A, a captcha appeared that said, unleash blessings. Like this wow. is all within the, the, the a couple of days, and and okay, we just, I, I think we're all going to be looking out for uh, <laughs> to, for, for signs in our captures now <laughs> right, going forward. Yeah, seriously, that's remarkable because that's like like generated by like an algorithm, and it's and this algorithm is generating these beautiful yeah. right and a prophetic. Couple, yeah, and a couple of years ago, I actually showed that pluralistic Muhammad like Twitter captcha to to the ceo of twitter the uh, one of the co-founders of twitter jack dorsey yeah, i showed i i, I, I showed uh, yeah i showed him that picture because I, I had a 30 minute meeting with him at the very end I, I was debating should i show him that picture what if he like deflates my balloon and says like oh no a, you know that there's a reason why that showed but he was shocked by it like he would like the ceo of twitter the founder of twitter he he stopped in his tracks and he said 
can you please email me that? Like, that is amazing. Like he was, he was amazed by it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, I, on the topic, I, tell us about that it, meeting. Like, how'd you, how'd you get that meeting and um, how was it to meet Jack? Yeah, because I, I think now I kind of regret not doing a, a better job, Tharik, of introducing you. Because I think, you know, just by way of conversation, I know you, I know you're not you're, you're going to not, probably not throw out names like Jack Dorsey, which you did, and I'm really glad you did. But I mean, Mashallah, you have appeared on numerous television shows, uh, you know, news outlets and so on, and uh, and, and and obviously by virtue of your work, have met people like the Jack Dorsey's of the world. So, uh, you know, feel, feel free without, you know, sort of doing this sort of Sufi Adab thing of, 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 of mentioning that, because I think it's really important for our listeners. And, and I also, obviously I want to, I want to also kind of shift the conversation and begin talking about some of the other work that Celebrate Mercy does, because I think oftentimes people do, you know, uh, for, for, for a lot of people, the point of contact with Celebrate Mercy are those webinars. But there's so much more that you do. So, um, but anyway, yeah, going back to the Jack Dorsey yeah. meeting. So, so yeah, that uh, uh, let me let me uh, back up a little bit from that and just kind of explain how that came to be. So, like, we started off doing these webinars once a year, yeah. right? Um, they were Please. very popular. Um, ten, you know, ten thousand people would join them. You know, in a webinar season, se- over seventy countries. These webinars became very popular. Um, and then in 2012, we actually. Uh, you know, started to do uh, mobilized campaigns. Um, so, you know, we, we say that we were now trying to starting to teach about the Prophet Muhammad through our actions. Um, when the, the United States ambassador, Chris Stevens, was killed in Libya by Muslim extremists, you know, at the consulate, um, many people, Benghazi. yeah, Benghazi uh, c- c- came up a lot during the Trump and Hillary, you know, of course, right, right. Yeah. That's why I Benghazi, yeah, the, the, the code word, right? So like, um, when Chris Stevens was killed at the consulate, many people said that he was killed because of that, uh, anti, you know, that, 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 that disgusting video about the prophet Muhammad that came out of, I think, produced in Southern California at the time in 2012, that angered so many Muslims. It was called the innocence of Muslims, right? And so this this gross uh, portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, angered Muslims around the world. People said initially said that Chris Stevens was killed because of this video about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? So we were like, well, we teach about the prophet, peace be upon him. We teach about his mercy, about, you know, how his, his, his default nature was always, you know, responding to evil with good. Can we take all of these webinar viewers and mobilize them into an act of goodness that responds to this evil with good? And we did this campaign called the Mercy Mail Campaign that uh, encouraged Muslims to write a beautiful letter, a condolence letter. To the family of Chris Stevens, and we told them go to Celebrate Mercy's website, write a write a note to the Chris Stevens family, and um, eventually the Chris Stevens family messaged us because they started to see this story. The story made it to the front page of Reddit, and then it got all over the media. Like it just for the first time, Celebrate Mercy was like getting media coverage, like worldwide on like CNN and BBC World News and stuff like you know all these things. So that began a new phase for Celebrate Mercy, where we started to do every few months a campaign that responded to evil with good, you know, inspired by a prophetic story. So it ins- we, we did campaigns that raised money for the victims of the San Bernardino shooting. We did campaigns recently that helped repair vandalized Jewish cemeteries. We did campaigns that raised money for the, the mosque victims, the, the mosque shooting victims in New Zealand, you know, like campaigns that have raised millions of dollars through LaunchGood um, and other, other platforms, you know, the, um, and that's where Jack Dorsey comes in because um, I actually met him in Knoxville, surprisingly, you know, uh, he, Jack Dorsey is not only the CEO of Twitter, he's also the CEO of Square. He's the CEO of two huge companies, you know, uh, in Silicon Valley, right? So, like, he 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 chose my a friend of mine's business in Knoxville to do a ten minute uh, film about a Syrian refugee that sells falafels in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I was invited. I was invited of all the square the companies that use Square for credit card transactions. He chose 
a Knoxville Syrian refugee that's that ended up being my friend. And I was invited to the premiere of this film uh, in his falafel restaurant. His, his name is Yassine, Yassine's Falafel. Um, and he was, by the way, recently selected on Good Morning America as the nicest business in America, the nicest. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I saw that. Yeah, he was on, that. yeah, that's my friend. Yeah. Uh, he's crashed on my couch in Cincinnati as well. And, uh, and so um, I was invited there. Jack Dorsey was there. And I just kind of boldly went up to him and said, you know, Jack, um, we use Twitter a lot with our campaigns. You know, we were just, you know, our, we were just retweeted by Ellen DeGeneres, the, the the Jewish cemetery campaign. I would love to have a coffee with you and tell you about the work we do at Celebrate Mercy. It, is there a <laughs> chance I could get time with you? You know, and I just, I was like, why not? Nice. Why not? Why not? And he said, absolutely. This is my email. That's my assistant. Get her email. The next time you're in California shoot us an email and I'd love to meet with you. And I was like, okay, you know, and, and, and literally like a few months later I was in I was in SoCal and I emailed him like on a, I think on, on the weekend and immediately like uh, his assistant called me like uh, hours later and said uh, he would like to meet with you. Yes. Um, so I, and I, and I, so I booked a flight to, from LA to, 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 to San Francisco. Uh, you remember Zay Checker actually ended up being on the same flight with me. And I was like, can you please make Dua? Like, I don't know what's going to happen with Jack Dorsey. And so I got th a 30 minute meeting with the CEO of Twitter and Square. Um, and I, and, 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 and subhanAllah, he, I, 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 and the night before I was like, I pulled an all nighter, just learning about him. Like who is Jack Dorsey? Like watching interviews with him. Like I kind of wanted to learn about him and I realized, and I learned that he was really attached to St. Louis because he grew up in St. Louis and he even has a branch of square in St. Louis. And I ended up in my, in my like a uh, laptop bag, I had a newspaper from the St. Louis, uh, the main newspaper of St. Louis post St. Louis post dispatch, I believe. And I was on the front page of the St. Louis newspaper about the Jewish cemetery that we funded the repairs for. And I just went in and I started showing him like the work we've done, but I really emphasized St. Louis. And I said, like, here's what we've done. Here are some of the projects we want to do. You know, we had this like neighbors campaign that we're trying to do and all this stuff. So uh, I, 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 I basically said, I, came, I went in with a couple of requests. Number one, um, could you be a mentor for me going forward? Like so that I could get advice from you going forward. Uh, number two, do you guys give out any grants, <laughs> you know, like to nonprofits, you know? Uh, actually, those were the two things I asked him. And and he said, number one, yes, I'll meet with you whenever you're in the area or even virtually, like, uh, you know, every few months we can have a short meeting. Number two, we don't give out grants, but I personally would like to donate to your cause. Uh, and I was like, great, you know, like, so he said, tell my assistant how to do that and like how to do that. And like, this is this is public information now. Like weeks later, one of my coworkers at Celebrate Mercy said, "Hey, we got this letter from Jack Dorsey. Do you know what? Do you want me to open it?" I said, "Yes, <laughs> open the letter, please." And Jack Dorsey became our largest ever donor, giving us a donation of one hundred thousand dollars. The CEO, wow. so like, wow. and I can literally say now that at Celebrate Mercy, two of our largest donors uh, are actually a Catholic and a Jew. You know, to to an organization that teaches about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's just amazing. That's right? That it really is. That really and is. And I met with him um, twice now. I've met with him twice now. Yeah. The uh, you you've referenced the uh, like the work that you did or the campaign that you um, uh, uh, organized around the uh, desecration of Jewish cemeteries. Um, just from what I've seen of your media appearances, and and not appearances, but at least where your name's been mentioned, for example, Stephen Colbert. Um, uh, Cenk Uger uh, of the Young Turks uh, talked about the campaign that you were doing um, uh, that and then how you were also then at that I think at that moment you were also raising money for the victims of the uh, New Zealand mosque shooting um, would you say that the Jewish cemetery um, campaign was probably the one that really kind of put Celebrate Mercy in the national and media spotlight or or were there other campaigns prior to that well, I think it's the it's actually the one for Chris Stevens where we that's the first time we got okay. about like the mate that's in back in 2012, but we had never seen such a viral response 
uh, like definitely the one for the Jewish cemeteries got the most viral and response and media attention. Like that's where we kind of went from print to television, I would say. Um, and, you know, I was on like CNN headline news and, um, you know, uh, interviewing, getting interviewed about that. So I think that really, uh, that was right after Trump got elected. Um, there was a lot of, you know, anti-Semitic attacks happening. Hate crimes were spiking against both Muslims and Jews. Um, and it just, um, people, you know, even we got a lot of flack even from Muslims for that. You know, every time we do a campaign, sometimes you have Muslims who, who sometimes say like, why, you know, why are, why, why aren't you supporting like the Syrian refugees? Why aren't you supporting this? Why aren't you supporting that? And, you know, my response is, you know, we can do both, you know, Muslims can do both. And, you know, I, not an either or, yeah, it's not an either or we can support our own and we can support those who are not Muslim. And, um, and, and I, and I often respond that the prophet was not called in the Quran, Rahmatan lil Muslimin. The prophet was not called a mercy to the Muslims. He was called a mercy to all the worlds, all people. And he stood up to pay his respect to a Jewish funeral. And I later learned that when the prophet Muhammad stood up to pay his respects for a Jewish funeral taking place in Medina, that was actually at a time of a lot of hostility between the Jews and the Muslims in Medina. You know, like there was a lot of political hostility taking place between the Jewish tribes and the Muslims of Medina. And he still stood up and said, is this not a human soul? Of course I should stand up. You know, when he was questioned about it, he said, of course I should stand up. This is a human soul. So the Jew, yeah, I think that the campaign uh, for, to raise money uh, uh, for the Jewish cemeteries was the one that got more media attention at the time than anything we had ever done before. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, were you able to transition to a point where you were able to devote your full time attention and time to the, you know, to celebrate mercy? And if so, when did that happen? So I had literally left Procter and Gamble, you know, for, for a year before I told my parents that I, I had left corporate America and, and, and jumped into this nonprofit job, you know, uh, for a year, I, you know, I was in Cincinnati at Procter and Gamble's headquarter, pro, headquarter, right? Headquarters. And then every couple of months I would visit Knoxville, Tennessee, and my parents never knew that I had left my job, you know, that I was now doing this full time. Um, you know, and, and one of my, my good friends in Knoxville told me, like, he, he made me even more worried because he said, you know, don't tell your immigrant parents, you know, who basically came here to have a stable life that you just left your very stable job to work in nonprofit, you know, not for a nonprofit that doesn't even have money. You know what I mean? That's right. I mean, just you sharing that is such a classic, like, immigrant story. And, uh, uh, having uh, done a stint in the nonprofit world as well in, in the middle, not, not that many years ago, um, I can certainly share your, um, your, uh, trepidation of bringing that up to your parents. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, you're th like one, yeah. My friend said, it's like you threw away everything they came to America for, like when you left your job, you know, like, you know, they were so proud of you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and I'm sure they're even prouder, but, um, uh, uh, yeah. So, so, okay. So that's when you transition and, and, um, and by being full time now. So that's how we've gotten to the point today where there's more and more programs. There's a, sounds like there's a Friday, a Friday program called Friday gems. There's a portrait of the prophet program. Tell us a little about the current state and, and, and how well, maybe, maybe technology, the, the, the world we live in has probably accelerated that, right? That the, well, I was going to say the pandemic. Yeah, the how pandemic. That, exactly. How does that, you know, influence? Yeah. Because now, and then also, I mean, maybe as a chan tangentially, if you could touch on, like now, because the entire Muslim community by and large has gone virtual, how do you compete in this? In the in, and I and I hate to frame it that way in in those sort of corporate terms, but how do you compete in that kind of a uh, of, of of a climate or that kind of? How do you stand out? How do you stand out? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's yeah. a better word. Thank the, you. The, yeah, many many offerings. Right? It's, it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's pretty amazing because it's almost like the pandemic brought us full circle. You know, we started off with the webinars, then we then we started doing these campaigns, then we move, then we started doing traveling events, conferences. Uh, from mosque to mosque. We actually took 
you know, the portrait of a prophet class and you know, as a weekend program and took it from mosque to mosque. And we, so we kind of stepped away the last few years, we've stepped away from doing these massive, like 30 speaker webinars one, you know, and we do, we do a small one, like a Ramadan resolutions, this and that, but we've moved away since I, I would say 2014 from these massive webinars, but then the pandemic hit and it just, it, we actually were positioned really nicely uh, to kind of go back to where we started uh, with all the experience, like we actually pulled out all the old Excel files, like, okay, here's a to-do list for a webinar, you know, here, let's, let's try to remember how we started off in 2010. And we, you know, while many Muslim organizations took, took, took some time, like we just jumped straight in and, you know, literally we have put out over 300 hours of content you know, since uh, mid March, so over an hour a day on average of of lectures, webinars, programming that we've done since the pandemic really started to spread rapidly in in the United States. So it's it's almost like we've come full circle as an organization. And, and, and because of the way your model was, sorry, I'm right. I mean, like because of the way your model was prior to the pandemic, you know, it was really plug and play. There was probably very little in terms of uh, adapting. Um, if you don't mind also real quick, like, so where, where are you at in terms of human resources? Like how many people, how many employees? And then, you know, if you could, I mean, obviously, you know, with whatever discretion you need to, um, I guess like, what is sort of the, like the elevator pitch business model, like of, of, of Celebrate Mercy? Because, um, one would imagine that, you know, obviously there's cost associated and you're raising money to not only cover costs, but people's salaries, et cetera, uh, uh, you know, just overhead in general. But beyond overhead, I imagine you're also probably giving stipends on honorariums to speakers and so on, right? Yeah. So, so uh, we, we've we grown a lot in the last couple of years, especially. Um, we are now at, uh, we have four full-time staff. Um, and we have, uh, including yourself, including myself. Yeah. Uh, um, I, 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 as a director, uh, we have four full timers, um, and we have multiple part timers as well. And, and also, you know, people doing like a few hours a week here and there. So I would say we're probably a team of 10 between part time and full timers. Um, yes, there are, there are honorariums to speakers cause we are doing, you know, uh, at least one webinar every week at this point, Friday gems is very popular. It's, you know, for many people who aren't able to go to the mosque during the coronavirus, it's kind of become a virtual Friday prayer or Friday khutbah, I would say not prayer, um, uh, quote, quote unquote, uh, khutbah or sermon, you know, and then, um, so yeah, we do have, uh, we, what my pitch to donors is that this is an organization that teaches that is solely focused on teaching about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through our words and our actions, our programs and our campaigns. And I often say, like, you know, that you'll get the biggest bang for your buck as a donation when you give to Celebrate Mercy. Because, you know, even Delia Mugahid will tell you, you know, she stated this in, in a recent, you know, event for us. She stated that no organization in recent years has uh, done more uh, in the you know positive work in the in the media in American media than Celebrate Mercy has had more of a positive impact in the mainstream media in the United States than Celebrate Mercy and we're just an organization of four full timers and a few right. part timers so um, and, and for those who don't know I mean if you could, like Dalia Mogahed is the I believe executive director at ISPU director of research director of research sorry at ISPU and I feel terrible because i know all the founders so they're gonna be really mad at me <laughs> yeah uh, my apologies uh Mozambique and, and but it's a, i mean you could yeah. essentially say i mean it is a research organization so she is like the main person right okay yeah so that's you know, thank you for uh giving <laughs> me a, a, like an escape but um yeah so no that i mean that that is high praise from coming from someone who has studied the re, you know the muslim community academically as much as ispu has so yeah so we 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 tell people like we have so many different different projects people can give to if they're passionate about people knowing the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him you know there we have various endowments that help with that for example you know the the book the, the Shama'il book that teaches about the prophet's personality we have a we have an endowment that focuses on putting Shama'il books into prisons 
you know, like, you know, like they, there's an estimate that are up to 9% of, uh, of the prison population in America is Muslim, many of them becoming Muslim in prison. Um, we have an endowment that provide that prints Shamal books every year for prisoners. We have a, we have a project right now translating, uh, and, and putting out different publications on the black lives around the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the black companions and black, you know, scholars and sages through the ages in, in our tr- Islamic tradition. You know, so we tell, you know, the core of what we teach about, you know, uh, is I, we talk uh, coming full circle here. We talked about Sunday school and how it emphasized this is haram. This is haram. We don't date. We don't do this. We don't do that. You know. Um, many Muslim kids grow up in America through uh, going th- through learning about their faith through law. You know, they learn about law before they learn love. You know, they're exposed to Islamic law before they're exposed to love. You know, and that is actually the opposite of how our whole tradition began. If you think about, um, you know, Sheikh Yahya Rodas sa- says it beautifully. He said that Muslims had to learn. Muslims at the beginning of, of, of our tradition in, in, in Mecca, Muslims had to learn how to govern their hearts before they could govern anyone else. For the first 13 years in Mecca, the prophet, peace be upon him, and the revelation was focused on what do we believe and people like reforming, you know, purifying their hearts, purifying their character, and just falling in love with the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? Those were the, the trailblazers of our faith, right? Uh, of this ummah. And so, but we, but most of the rules, quote unquote rules came in Medina, even, even things like fasting in Ramadan, the obligation to go to Hajj, you know, Zakat, these things all came in Medina after the first 13 years. We've reversed that with our children. You know, we go, we go to our children and we say, you got to pray, you got to do this, you got to do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. But before they've even fallen in love with God, before they've even fallen in love with the prophet. You know, and many adults, like I, I, I tell people, like you're from the Bay Area, right? So I, I ask kids a lot, or I even ask at a mosque, tell me how tall Steph Curry is. Can you tell me? Raise your hand if you can. And sometimes in the when I'm giving a khutbah, the kids like blurt out the answer during the khutbah, like six three. You know, like uh, well, okay, tell me, tell me Steph Curry's shoe size. You know, the uh, the Warriors player, right? Golden State Warriors, and then and so people can answer basic questions, especially kids, basic questions about star athletes, uh, celebrities. Um, but if you ask children, how many, ch- how many kids did the prophet Muhammad have, you know, can you describe how he talked and what he looked like and how he walked and, you know, uh, and, and just basic things about, you know, the, who are the mothers of the believers? Can you tell me the names of the mothers of the believers? You know, the, the hands don't go up anymore. Even adults can't answer some basic questions. And if we are supposed to love the prophet, peace be upon him, more than anyone else, what do we have to show for it? You know, if we can't answer basic things, like if someone says, you know, do you love, you know, Betsy? You know, like, well, I don't know Betsy. Like, I tell I don't know anything about Betsy. Like, of course I don't love Betsy, but like, so how, how can we claim to love someone that we don't know? And that's my pitch is like, if you want to support something as a sadaqa jariya, that's solely focused on people knowing and respecting and falling in love with the prophet, peace be upon him, then this is a cause. This, this is a good cause. Yeah. And, and you mentioned sadaqa jariya, and I think a good place for us to, uh, you know, rap would be for you to talk about future projects. And I think within that, or as you discuss that, you know, how do you see, like, what does the future of online programming look like when we return, when there is a semblance of returning back to normalcy? Like, so I would love your thoughts. I mean, because as a content provider as well, you know, obviously on a much smaller scale than yourself, um, as a content provider, you know, I'm really, you know, curious and trying to study what what it looks like and how do you distinguish yourself so yeah i I mean if you could comment on that as well as as we kind of wrap up your future projects and and any kind of peering into the into the uh into the looking glass as it were and 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 seeing where the future you know what lies ahead yeah so so right now you know uh, alhamdulillah you know we're very grateful that in 2020 you know our 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 online content has really multiplied by 11 you know in terms of number of views number of hours viewed um in 2020 alone 
we had over, you know, people viewed our content for over 70,000 hours, you know, uh, between Facebook and YouTube. It was a huge growth, uh, you know, w- during the pandemic. Um, we we want to just keep growing from there. Like we want to put out a lot more content. We have a really beautiful uh, class that we just started uh, called Portrait of a Prophet, um, uh, where we go through the entire book uh, of the Shema'il, which is a book uh, of 400 plus uh, hadiths or traditions on the personality, the beauty, the habits, the lifestyle of the Prophet Muhammad. Most people don't know that the Shema'il book, the, the, Shema, the Shema'il uh, book of Imam Tirmidhi for centuries was the most popular book in the Muslim world after the Quran. You know, people grew up learning the Shema'il, but many people don't even know what the word Shema'il means. It's a, it's a whole genre of, of like, what was it like to meet the prophet? It's not, it's not his biography. It's not, it's not, it's not legal rulings. It's like, what was it like to sit with the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? To getting see, to know. Getting to know getting his to personality, know. Yeah. his persona, right? right? So we have a, a beautiful class that we've just launched um, that people can sign up for. It's going all the way up until Ramadan. It's taught twice a week. You get access to the videos for six months. And I would encourage everyone to, to sign up for it. You can watch the opening session. It's, it's out there on our YouTube channel. Um, so we're just going to ramp up. We have during Black History Month, we're actually going to have the book published, uh, the book published, the first book published on Black lives around the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That's a that's a project that, you know, donors funded. We have classes on the, you know, we have a class with that book starting during Black History Month in February. Um, we're just going to ramp up online programming in a major way. Um, we, you know, you know, going based off of your example, following your example, maybe one day we'll have a podcast soon. That's what we're hoping, you know, just, you know, profit related um, programming on a podcast. Um, Right now we're just strictly focused on putting out as much content as we can uh, online content. And I forgot to mention next month, we're starting a program tailored for teenagers. Um, We've got got a yeah, we've gotten Who a lot of, about that. No, no, as a yeah, father of teenage, yeah, 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 yeah. We've gotten so many requests. You know, uh, you know. Sadly, I talked about what what is the impact of us focusing on the law before love. You know, fo- just just hammering our kids with haram, haram, haram before they fall in, in love with God and His messenger. The impact is that in America right now, uh, almost one in every four Muslims who grew up Muslim has left Islam. You know, Pew, the Pew, a Pew Research study has shown that 23%, this was a couple of years ago, it may be even worse now, 23% of people who grew up Muslim in America say that they no longer identify with the faith as adults. So we're losing our kids if we don't teach them, you know, uh, the basics of, of, of who the prophet is, who is God, you know, instilling them with this love before hammering them with the rules. So we're starting programs for teenagers next month um, with really great teachers. Half of that set, half of those classes will be just discussion and Q and a, you know, where they can feel like they're in a safe space virtually to a- to ask about any doubts that they're having about the faith. Um, we're, we want to also do things for younger children eventually as well. So yeah, we're, we're just going to ramp up online programming. We also do a bunch of other things like trips. We do Omra trips, which we can't do right now. We take groups to Jerusalem the traveling conferences and every now and then we'll do a campaign as well. We raised a lot of money for people that were struggling with COVID, you know, due to COVID with financial uh, difficulties, but um, the campaigns will be ongoing and eventually we'll start doing the conferences again. But this pandemic, you know, there's a verse in the Quran that says you may hate something, but it it could be good for you. You know, so many people have died and gotten sick as a result of the pandemic. But at the same time, the silver lining is that, so many people have fallen in love with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during this time. So many people have learned their faith in different ways and connected with people in different ways. And, you know, we're, we're grateful that we were a, a means for people to, uh, you know, we just pray that God accepts it from us and that we pray that, you know, all this work is presented, you know, as a gift to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for everything that he has, has given us. I mean, I mean, yeah, no, I think that's, it's, yeah, it's just great to hear you say all those things, Tarek, and just uh, like, like what some of the ideas that you have that are sort of germinating in the, in that mind of yours. Um, it, because I think that 
what's beautiful is the, the, you know, there's an abundance of material. So it's not like you're ever going to run out of material. Right. Like the well is never going to dry up uh, by God's grace. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, inspiration about sharing the beauty of the prophet. So it's an endless well. And number two, like, I, I, I also appreciate the fact that unlike a lot of content that's there online, you know, your approach isn't uh, academic, as it were, in terms of like, yeah, you're doing classes, but the classes revolve around teaching about the beauty of the prophet. It's not, you're not doing a class on Hanafi fiqh. In right, right, right. As equally important as that is, you know, the, the, I think it's a very disciplined approach because I, I, and I, and I've been, I struggle with this, not only here with this platform, but I know having worked in the nonprofit space, Muslim nonprofit space specifically to stay within your lane and, and to know your strengths and to grow on that rather than spreading yourself thin and trying to be the one all, you know, be all like one stop shop. And so it's like, okay, you want to learn about Hanafi jurisprudence or Maliki jurisprudence? You go there. But if you know, and, and you yourself would probably direct people to certain other avenues, whereas your focus remains singular, right? I mean, I, I don't want to. I mean, yeah. I, I hope I'm characterizing. No, that. you're you know, the, the focus. The focus is that you know is is the Bedouin that came to the Prophet peace be upon him and said, you know, um, uh, I I don't you know the, uh, when is when is the end of time? You know, when is the day of judgment? And he said, the Prophet responded, you know, uh, what have you prepared for the end of time? And the Bedouin, you know, the Bedouins were, you know, I, I call them kind of like the rednecks of Arabia at the time, you know, like, cause I'm, you know, and I'm from Tennessee, I can say these things, right? <laughs> so like, you know, they, they were, they had no filters often with the prophet Muhammad. So they, and that, that's the beauty of it is that they, they asked him things that the, some of the, 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 the more seasoned companions could not ask him, you know, so they were, they were shy to, yeah, yeah, they were yeah. blunt, they were blunt. And so he said, honestly, I don't have much prepared for the day of judgment. I haven't prayed that much. I haven't done extra prayers, extra fasting, but I do know this. I do know that I love Allah. I love God and I love the messenger of God. I love, I love you. Oh, prophet Muhammad, I love you. You know, so what does that get me? Like basically saying like, what does that get me? You know? And he said, a person will be with the one he or she loves. A person will be, you know, so on the day of judgment in our infinite afterlife, we will be with the one we love. And that's, that's what we're focused on is like, you can't love someone you don't know. You know, um, that's, that's, we're devotional, we're, we are a devotional organization, like know him. And when we fall in love with him, hopefully, you can participate in some of these campaigns that, that, that show the show his love, you know, it's, it's like, I, I forgot this quote, I, I, I was going to say it earlier, but the a beautiful quote by St. Francis of Assisi, who said, preach the gospel and if necessary use words you know preach the gospel if necessary use words but back then back in my ahmadidat days it was like the opposite of that you know use words and if necessary use actions right but like but now you know like coming full circle through this organization through you know the great teachers i've been blessed to sit with at these dean intensives rehlas and other places you know it's it's more about like let's let's taste this religion Let's fall in love with the prophet, peace be upon him, and let that reflect on our actions and on our limbs. And people will see the beauty of the faith through, you know, through that, hopefully, you know, whatever we can do to reflect the prophet's beauty, hopefully. Uh, I know we can continue this conversation. In fact, I have like, you know, four, four or five questions that are just, you know, burgeoning, like there's, yeah, want, want, you know, wanting to be asked, but I think it's a beautiful place to leave. So I want to put a nice little bow on it. And I think, and I want to thank you for, um, you know, uh, uh, I think so eloquently wrapping, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, I think, you know, pretty long ranging interview that we've had. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your experience here. Uh, Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. No, we, we, yeah, we would love I to mean, have you, you back. I mean, you all, you all like, like the currency back in the nineties was the, the cassette tapes and you guys are like, really, you guys are being, you know, inshallah, I pray that Allah, God accepts from you because you, I mean, you, you are, you are providing an avenue for us to learn from many of our teachers and, and the people that are doing very inspiring work. So, you know, um, uh, okay, let me let me say one more thing here. You know that 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 that, that captcha that said policeman Gabriel. You know the the 
uh, it, it kind of came full circle for me. That came full circle for me later when going through the Shema'el book, there is a hadith in the Shema'el that talks about where the prophet, that says the prophet, peace be upon him, had a pulpit uh, built in his mosque for his poet, Hassan bin Thabit. You know, and on that pulpit, on the mimbar, he used to recite poetry that praised the prophet, peace be upon him, and defended the prophet, peace be upon him, from the poetry of some of the enemies, right? And the, 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 the hadith said, the prophet, peace be upon him, told Hassan bin Thabit, because of your work, you will be supported and protected by the angel Jibreel, by the Holy Spirit, by Ruh al-Qudus. You know, and that hit me like a ton of bricks later. But so this goes to show that the work that you guys are doing, like the, you know, promote, you know, the arts and, and, and sharing our culture, you know, the cultural imperative, right? Um, the, the platform that you guys is, is like a mimbar, uh, hopefully of, of Hassan bin Thabit, inshallah. Wow. I, 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 I'm rendered speechless, which is rare. So uh, thank you, Tharik, so much for those beautiful words. And, uh, you know, may Allah, you know, from your mouth to God's ears, and, <laughs> and, you know, may Allah accept all of that. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I really, you so beautifully captured what really for us has been always the genesis and purpose of the show. So thank you for that. Um, where can people find you if they want to engage you online, if they want to reach out to you, find out more about Celebrate Mercy, please, uh, you know, do uh, leave us with that. Yeah, uh, well, on, just on social media, I'm on, I'm on pretty much all the platforms, so they can look me up personally. They can contact me through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, Celebrate Mercy, you can go to our Facebook page, social media pages, website, um, and, you know, just we encourage you to learn more. Uh, definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be a great way to stay connected. And um, hopefully sign up for some of these uh, classes and webinars. And of course, CelebrateMercy.com. CelebrateMercy.com. Yeah, I, mean, I left out the most important part there. CelebrateMercy.com. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you don't mind, like, like I guess the Twitter, like your Twitter handle. And, yeah, all and, of it is. Well, cele- so. Yeah, just search for Celebrate Mercy. One word. You know, we 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 removed the space recently, so it's one word. Celebrate Mercy. You can find us all over. You know, social media and YouTube. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Tharik. Uh, Omar, uh, why don't you do the honors and close this out? Yeah, absolutely. Well, f- just echoing everything Pervez said, and uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just surprised. Not surprised. I shouldn't be surprised because I knew you're doing good work. But I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to to e- learn that even more good work that I didn't, I wasn't aware of is is happening, and, and excited for. Uh, for some of the offerings you have, I'm definitely going to yeah. take advantage of of those myself. You know, and, and just pray, yeah, pray for our team. You know, this is where it's a team effort, and uh, all those who, you know, some of the early adopters, that I guess the I would say the angel philanthropists, people who donated early on and still donate monthly. You know, it's it's a big team effort, and all of that, inshallah, is a sadaqa jariya. So pray for us and all the supporters and the, the board members. Keep us in your prayers, inshallah. I mean, I mean, absolutely. And uh, thank you, as always, listeners, for uh, checking out the episode. Uh, you can uh, email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can obviously hit us up on facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. You can also find us on Twitter at diffusec. Uh, do do uh, listen out for future episodes that are coming soon. And we have a lot of content planned for 2021. We are super excited about. And I think no better way than we kicked off 2021 with Tharik al Masidi. So thank you, Tharik, for joining us. And uh, making this inshallah an auspicious year so uh thanks listeners as always do catch us again on the next episode of diffuse congruence (laughs) 